Well, good morning. It's good to see all of you who are here in the building, those of you who are joining us online from wherever you are. We are on the last Sunday of a series, so that means next week we're starting a new series. Um, and next week will be a great time for you to invite some people to come in so they can jump in at the front of a series because we you know for those of you who are new here, we usually do teaching in series so that we can kind of take one message and just you know pound it home for you know week after week. And so we're going to be talking about the lies that we tell ourselves, not just lies we believe, lies we tell ourselves, you know, kind of the stuff that goes on in your head and, um, you know, kind of determines our attitudes and outlook of life and all of that. So that's going to start next week. Be sure to invite somebody to come. This week, we are wrapping up this series that we've been on uh, for like eight weeks now. It's called Who's in Your Corner? And so for the last several weeks, we've been talking about, you know, people that we, we need to have in our corner. Uh, people like mentors and experts and people like, you know, editors and butt kickers, you know, because every now and then you need a <clears throat> in the butt to do what God's called you to do. Or, you know, people who are in the encouragers and, and even people that may be in, in some part of society or culture, they may be a reject, right? Um, meaning that they require extra grace or some type of, you know, extra effort on our part to, to get along. But God uses them in our lives to shape us. Well, I want to talk about something a little bit different today that's related to all of this. I want to talk about the corner itself. Now, by the way, this thing's echoing, so stagehand, somebody come turn a volume down or something on this. You can't hear it, but it's driving me nuts. Um, so anyway, yeah, it's going crazy. Uh, so anyway, I don't, I don't know a whole lot about boxing you know, or MMA. I'm not one of those guys who likes the violent stuff. I'm one of those who gets kind of squeamish when I see somebody getting a blow in the face. So um, anyway, but still with the boxing thing, as I started looking at this sermon series, I started to learn some stuff about boxing. First of all, it used to be a ring, like it was a circle. And so that's why they call it the boxing ring, even though it's now a boxing square. Um, and when they added the corners, they started adding the rules. Like you fight for three minutes, then you take a one minute break, you go to your corner. But then there's also like these neutral corners so that if you knock your opponent down, they have, you know, 10 seconds to recover. And in those 10 seconds while they're recovering, you know, you have to go to a neutral corner. You can't go to your corner, the opponent didn't go to theirs, or listen, at, at some point, if you are just getting hammered, you can retreat to a neutral corner, and that's when the referee will watch carefully, because if you can't get out of that corner, they'll call the fight. And so I thought it was really exciting that when I saw this, that I guess I've heard the announcer say this, you know, in the blue corner, you know, we have so-and-so, and in the red corner, but I never really paid attention that there's a blue corner and a red corner, okay? So maybe some of you have noticed that. So that means if, if you were in a fight, you would have your corner, the opponent has the other corner, and then there's the two neutral corners. Now, the reason this is important because, you know, when you're in a fight for your life, whether it's in business or whether it's finance, whether it's with your kids, sometimes marital, you know, fights or just the fight of life. I mean, it really does sometimes get physical, right? I mean, it starts to take a toll on us physically. If you run to the wrong corner, you're in trouble. You know what I'm saying? I mean, if, if you were to run to the opponent's corner, of course you're in trouble. And it's not like they're going to pummel you. I mean, let's just think of boxing for a moment. If you happen to go to the wrong corner and sit down on the stool and you're in the opponent's corner, it's not that they're all going to jump in there and start beating you up because the referee would call that and that wouldn't be fair. But here's the thing. They will start telling you things that are deceptive. Maybe they're lies. Maybe, maybe it's false encouragement. You know, In other words, you're losing the fight and they're like, you're doing great. Keep it up. Right? <laughs> Truth is, you're not doing so good. Or maybe they're like, hey, you need to watch for this blow. And actually, they're getting ready to hit you with something else. So if you run to the opponent's corner, of course, you're in danger. You could be easily misled. But if you run to those neutral corners, it's also dangerous. Because, see, when you run to the neutral corner, that's where the fight goes from, like, the ring to your head. And all of a sudden, you're in this corner and you might be deceiving yourself. You might be thinking you're doing better than you actually are. Come on, some of you have you've been in these marital issues, you know, those of you who are married, and you just kind of went to a neutral corner by yourself and you got in your head space and you exaggerated and thought you were better than you were or you thought it was worse than it was or whatever the case was. And in that corner, when it's just a conversation with yourself, man, not the best corner to be in, right? There's, there's really one place. It's your 
corner. There's your corner where you need to run to and where you need to fight from. It's the place that you're going to find safety, security. It's the place where you're going to find good information. It's the place where you're going to get instruction and encouragement, maybe some correction, right? It's where you're going to get some direction. It's where you're going to get a perspective from someone else who has a different vantage point on what's going on. Now, some of you have been in, again, these relational battles, and you've gone to the wrong corner, and you got some bad advice. And the whole time you were getting it, you didn't realize it was bad advice. You know, because they were sitting there, you know, I'll tell you, if that was me, I wouldn't put up. I'd go back and tell them. And you're like, yeah, and you go and do that. And it didn't work too well, did it? <laughs> right? Did not get the results you wanted. That was the opponent's corner. I know, it looked like a friendly face, but they weren't on your side. And then you go to your own space, and you get in your own head, and you come up with a great plan and all that, and you come back and say, I don't know why that didn't work. It sounded awesome in my head, right? But you need to have a corner with people in your corner who are giving you, you know, a godly perspective or a different perspective that, that really do have your best interest at heart. So here's the question I want us to look at today is not who's in your corner, but where is your corner? Because I'll tell you, sometimes in the fight of life, come on, there, there's been situations where we're just getting pummeled and we get dizzy and it's like, I don't know where to go. I don't know where to turn. I don't know who to go to. And when I started thinking about someone who was in a literal fight for his life and ran to the wrong corner, this guy comes to mind. His name's Elijah. He's an Old Testament prophet. You'll see his story in the book of First Kings back in the Old Testament. And I want to focus on part of the story that appears in the chapters 18 and 19 of First Kings. And so this is a guy, he is literally in a fight for his life at this point, and he runs to the wrong corner. Now, let me give you a little background, okay? At this time in the history of Israel, the kingdom is divided. So think back to our civil war, north and south. Let's just imagine the south won, succeeded from the union. Now you've got the north and the south, and they're trying to, you know, move forward. Okay, some of you, you think that's a dream. That's not. That's not, okay? It's not ideal. Y'all are laughing, Okay. But you can just imagine. So that's what happened. You've got like the 12 tribes of Israel. Two of them have stayed together. They're Israel in the north. The rest of them pulled out. It's always over money, right? Okay, not, not the Civil War is more than that. But still, you know, in this case, it was about money and power and all of that stuff. Okay, and Ahab is the king over the north. And so Ahab starts out, you know, kind of as a good guy, but quickly becomes a very bad king. And he marries this lady named Jezebel, who is a Phoenician woman, who, that means not Israelite, does not worship the God of Israel, has Canaanite gods of Baal, that's the male god, and Asherah, the female counterpart, and all these other gods that go with them. And she is like uber religious with her, you know, false gods. And so she has like all these prophets and prophetesses of Baal and Asher that she brings in the wake when she marries Ahab. And the reason Ahab marries marries her is political alliance because the southern kingdom, they're still kind of at, bat, at odds with one another. You need to have some friends to go to fight because there's two tribes to ten tribes and he makes these political alliances with really the enemies of God. And so Jezebel comes in and she moves onto the palace compound all of these prophets and prophetesses of Baal and Asherah. 450 prophets of Baal move into the country with her. 400 prophets or prophetesses of Asherah, the female goddess, come in with her. So 850. Now, she and then Ahab turn the people of Israel against God towards these other gods, and then they violently, violently try to purge the country of all of God's prophets, the true God's prophets, you know, the ones who are the voice piece for God, because that's what prophets are. They're not the only ones that God's talking to, but they're the ones who kind of highlight what God is saying and what God is doing and bring attention. So they really become, kind of become the microphone or the megaphone through which God reveals himself to his people at this time. And so here, Ahab and Jezebel have turned people away from God. They've turned the nation to these false gods. They've got all of these prophets and prophets. And Elijah, he just gets so frustrated, he summons all of these prophets of Baal and Asherah to a showdown. They, they get up on this mountain. It's a mountain where they worship, not necessarily a mountain where God's people worship. So he gets them on their own turf. He's like, hey, we're going to the boxing ring. We're going in here to fight. And, and you get to have home field advantage. 
And he said, here's what we're going to do. We're going to build the altars and we're going to go through the rituals of how we worship our God. And it's, you know, both of us, you know, kind of do this through burnt sacrifices. So you build your altar, bring all of your stuff, but do not bring a fire. I'll do the same. Not going to bring a fire. Whichever God can light his own fire. That's going to be the God that we as a nation will serve. You see, when, when Elijah does this, he's not just trying to prove them wrong and him right. He's trying to turn the hearts of people back to God. He's trying to turn the king and the queen to God. And so he just says, let's just have a showdown. And so we've got them all up here, home field advantage. You guys go first. And while they are out there, you know, trying to, you know, worship their God and get him to answer with fire, nothing happens. And they get to the point where they are in such a frenzy, they begin to cut themselves and mutilate themselves because they would believe, you know, if your God sees blood, maybe he's going to show up, right? And he's taunting them. I mean, it, you can imagine. It's like they're in the middle of the ring doing their whole thing. And he's that guy on the sidelines going, you know, come on, man, cut yourself. Bleed some more, buddy. Right? I mean, he is just taunting them. And nothing happens. And then it becomes his turn. And he builds his altar, puts his sacrifice. And then he does something really unusual. Some of you have heard this story growing up in church, right? Um, he, he brings barrels, not just like buckets, barrels of water and pours over the top of the altar so much so it says it drenches everything it runs down the rocks and it, it fills up a ditch that's going around and now a lot of times we've heard that story if you've heard that story as if Elijah's trying to make it really hard for God you know I'm going to show him how big God is I'm going to wet the wood I'm going to make it so hard they'll know it's God listen Anybody who shows up with their own fire miraculously, from whether it's from heaven, spontaneous combustion, or whatever, you don't need to wet the wood. That in itself is impressive. It has nothing to do with making it hard. If you go back and read a little bit of the story just before this, you will see that God's judgment upon the nation of Israel has been demonstrated by a drought. And they've not had rain for years. It is drought and so it's like when he starts bringing these barrels of water and pouring over and one after the other. And whenever you go to this area, you know, when you go to this mountain today and you see how far they had to go to get the water and what they had to do to bring it back. I mean, this is dramatic, right? This is like when gas is $5 a gallon. Somebody's in the parking lot just spraying the nozzle everywhere. You're like, dude, what are you doing, right? Don't be crazy. He's taking what they need the most and that they have the least of. And he's just pouring it out. See, that was the offering to God. I mean, there's a whole sermon in that right there. You know, the very thing that we need the most and have the least and we just want to hold on to with everything because we don't trust God. And he says, no, 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 I trust God. And if you read the story, after all of this, God sends rain. It's amazing. So anyway, he does all of this. And of course, lightning falls from the sky, whether that was lightning or, you know, fire or however God did it. God lights his own fire. And all of a sudden, Elijah, in the fight of his life, has proven that there is only one God. The other ones are a bunch of made-up mythology. They don't even exist. They're, they're not real. And so when the people see that they have been duped, that they have been deceived, that they have been led astray, Elijah oversees the execution because here's the thing, this blast for me, you know, pointing people away from God, it is a death sentence for these prophets. And so Elijah oversees the execution of 450 prophets of Baal. Now, it's not that Elijah does it by himself. Sometimes we read the story and think one man killed 450 people. And it's like, dude, why was number 450 still around? I mean, 449. And it's like, dude, I don't think we got a shot. I'm leaving, right? But no, the people rose up and killed these prophets. And Elijah oversaw it because they, they had been duped. And what Elijah thinks is going to happen next is that all the people are going to serve God and the king and the queen herself are going to say, oh my goodness, we were wrong. There is only one God and they're going to turn back to God. That's what he thinks is going to happen. He, you know, it's like we've been fighting for three minutes. I just plastered those guys, laid them out, right? I mean, I killed them. I mean, literally, he killed them, right? Go back to your corner. And he's like, man, here, here's where it all goes. They're going to give me the belt and we're all going to go home and worship God. That's not what happened. It says, now Ahab told Jezebel everything that Elijah had done and how he had killed the prophets with the sword. So Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah and said, may the gods, she's doubling down on these false gods. May the gods deal with me 
be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like that of one of them. I mean, here, here it is. He's sitting on the bench in his corner, right? He's taking a breather. And it's like, all right, here we go. The whole nation is going back to God. And she's yelling from the other side across the ropes. So help me, gods, if I don't kill you within 24 hours. So now, all of the resources of the entire nation, not just the prophets, not just a few little henchmen, all the resources of the nation, the armies, the special forces, the military, even all of the citizens are now all leveraged by her power and authority against one man. And naturally, Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. It says, when he comes to Beersheba in Judah, now this is the southern thing, okay? So this is now, when we went from the northern kingdom across the Mason-Dixon, I'm down in the south because they are not going to chase me into foreign territory. Right? He thinks he's safe. He left his servant there. So he's got somebody with him and he leaves him while he himself goes a day's journey into the desert. He came to a broom tree, sat down under it, and then prayed that he might die. Ever been there? Have you ever been there to where it's like, you know what, I'm still praying, but the only prayer I can kind of utter is, God, just kill me. I just, would you, I don't have, I'm not suicidal, but I'm not going to avoid the truck that swerves accidentally into my lane. Been there? I'm not suicidal, but now's a good time for my brakes to fail. I'm not suicidal, but if somebody breaks in, points a gun at me, I'll probably smart talk my way to an early death. I'm not suicidal. I mean, I'm not going to do it myself, but God, I really wish you would. I'm just done. Anybody been there? Here's what he said. I've had enough. It's not just that I've had enough, Lord. I'm not enough. I'm not enough. Take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. And you know, growing up when I heard this verse right here, no better than my ancestors, when I read it, I always thought that he was comparing himself to like really bad ancestors. In other words, it's like, yeah, I'm no better than my drunk Uncle Bob. You know, he was just such a wino and never. I'm no better than, you know, my, my cousin who served time in the pen and did what. I am just no better than my deadbeat, what dad who left or what. I always thought he was comparing himself to the worst. He's not. He's comparing himself to other prophets. And he said, you know what? I'm no better than them. They tried to turn people back to God. They couldn't do it either. They tried so hard. Moses was trying so hard to get these people to focus on God. He wrestled with them continually. God continued to do something in the people of Israel. Praise God for that. But the truth is, Moses was like, gosh, these people are driving me nuts. Why can't they just focus on God? Why can't they stay true to God? And then all the other prophets came along and Elijah said, you know what? They weren't able to turn the hearts of people back to God. I am no better than them. And then he lay down under the tree and fell asleep because that's what we do when we're depressed. We just get on the sofa or get in the bed, pull up the sheets and just lay there. All at once an angel. Now when we see the word angel, we suddenly think, here come the wings, right? There are no <laughs> wings on angels. Correction. Those that zoom in there for the people online, right? Angels don't have wings, okay? Um, I know. Well, I thought we always had wings. On the Hallmark cards, they have wings. On the sweet little, you know, home goods stuff you put on the wall, they have wings. On anything you buy at a truck stop with religious art, it has wings, okay? Angels don't have wings. That's seraphim and cherubim. That's like saying a cat and a horse. They're not the same thing, okay? Angels don't have wings, okay? Angels just show up as people, and a lot of times it's not until looking back on it that they even realize this was more than a person. But here's the thing in Hebrew. The word messenger... We don't know if that means like divine messenger from God, Gabriel, Michael, all that kind of stuff, or if that's just some dude who came up messenger. It's only in the context can we kind of figure out what one is meant. And that's why whenever you're reading the scripture and you see the angel, it's kind of weird. How come they didn't recognize the angel? Didn't you see the wings? You know, there's not any wings, <laughs> right? So this word literally, if you look at kind of a Hebrew to English translation, is literally messenger. And in fact, a lot of the kind of, um, not Christians, but Hebrew scholars will sit there and say, this was a guy or a dude, this was a man, That's a messenger. And it's only looking back that you realize the dude who came into my life was actually giving me a message. All at once, an angel touched him and said, get up and eat. And he looked around, and here's how we know it's just a dude and not a majestic being. 
By his head was a cake of bread baked over coals. Angels don't need to make fires. They can just make bread, right? Okay, so he said he baked over hot coals and a jar of water, and he ate and he drank and he lay down again because that's what we do. We just get out of the bed. Y'all never get out of the pajamas. Don't get ready to go anywhere. Go to the refrigerator, get some hagen dazs go back and just, you know, eat the blues away, right? Anybody? Come on. He looked around, and there by his head was a cake of hot coals. He laid down. He did it again. Now it says, the angel of the Lord comes back. And now it's an angel of the Lord. This is not just a dude. This is a dude that God's using. Right? He comes back a second time, touched him, and said, get up and eat, for the journey is too much for you. Listen, I don't know why you're out here in the middle of nowhere, but I'm a passerby in the middle of nowhere, and I know you're trying to run from something or run to something, and this is like wearing you out. And sometimes people come across your life and go, I don't know what's going on with you, but you've got all the, all the appearance of somebody who is worn out. And whatever you're going through is too much for you. And so he got up and he ate and he drank. And then strengthened by that, he traveled 40 days and 40 nights over a month to Horeb, the mountain of God. Horeb is also known as Sinai. This is where God showed up with Moses to give him the Ten Commandments, spoke the cloud, all of that, you know, miraculous, mysterious stuff that happened. This is God communing with Moses. He, he says, you know what? I'm running, and I'm, but, but I'm still open for God, and if I'm going to hear from God, maybe I'll go to the place that God did the most unexplainable, undeniable, most miraculous, supernatural thing. Let me, let me just go there. Maybe he'll talk to me. This is, what, this, this is what's happening here. This is a guy who's going church hopping for trying to find a revival. He, he, he's desperate, and he just hears something's going on at some church somewhere, or there's some you know, guy, some prophet somewhere, there's some evangelist somewhere, there's some guy on TV. Maybe if I just go there where people say that they've heard from God, maybe I'll hear from God. And so he's just going in search of something, hopefully to find God. goes on, it said, And the word of the Lord then comes to him when he's in this cave. What are you doing here? Elijah. Listen, God never asks a question he doesn't know the answer to. When he's asking the question, it's for our benefit. Come on, why, why are you here? It's like, are you kidding me? They're trying to kill me up there. I'm the only one that's left. And here's the thing. What he's saying is, Elijah, I know what's going on in your life, but you've run to the wrong corner. This is not where you're supposed to run to. You see, if we were going to use this boxing analogy, here's the thing. You didn't run back to your corner. You ran to one of the neutral corners. You have left your servant. You've left your people. You're now in isolation. And now you're seeking me, but you're seeking me in isolation. And here's the thing. We are more likely to isolate when we are really successful or when we're losing. I mean, because it's one of the same. Come on, when you're really successful, right? When the business is doing great, it's hard to take advice from other people whose business is doing average or failing. I, there, there's, there's pastors, there's politicians, there's CEOs that when they are doing great, they start to isolate and alienate because other people just don't get it, right? And so all of a sudden they've gotten to a place where they're not listening to other people. They run to the neutral corner and here they are. It's like, dude, I am killing it at work. I am killing it at church. God's doing so. Look at all this stuff. And they get in a corner by themselves and the head games of their excellence and, you know, the hubris starts to get them and all of that. And then they start making some really dumb decisions when the fight resumes. And that's how a lot of them end up falling and just blowing up their ministries, ruining their business, losing their families, losing their fortune because they were doing so good. You say, what happened? They ran to the wrong corner. They just ran to the neutral corner, sat there thinking they had it. But then the other time is when you're losing. And when you're losing, you just want to isolate. You don't want everybody to know. You want to get away from the people who do know. You're going to go and try and figure it out, and you run to that corner. And listen, both of those, when you're winning and when you're losing, the self-talk is exaggeration and self-deceiving. Happens all the time. Happens to all of us. We'll talk more about that in this next series. But listen, isolation can do to your mind what your opponent can do to your face. <laughs> Beat it up. Beat it up. You say, well, so... So where should he go? Where, where, why are you doing here, Elijah? You should be in your place. Well, where is my place? And here it is. Your place is with your people. Your place is with your people. Come on, you know what We got a people. I got a people. You got a people? I got a people. I got my people. Your people may be your church. Could be your team. Could be your group. Could be your gang. I mean, come on, gangs are not necessarily you know, great characters, but that's a people, right? Political parties, that's my people. 
right? And when you get together, you kind of you just walk in and go, hey, this is my people. I got a people. We're your people. Your place is with your people. When you lack a people, you will always feel out of place. There are some of you, I mean, some of you, I hope are watching this. I mean, I, gosh, there's so many people that come to mind. But some, of, some people have moved to certain places thinking this is an ideal place. And you're so alone because you don't have a people. And when you don't have a people, I mean, there's nothing more lonely than being in a room full of people and not having a people. Than being in a room full of people. Than being in a city where it's so beautiful and there's so much activity and so much stuff. And you're by yourself. Oh, there is nothing more alone, nothing more alone than being in the ring with crowds in the stands and you're not even in your corner, you're standing in a corner all by yourself. There is nothing more lonely than that. Your place is with your people. For people who say, well, you know, and I know some of you are new here today and it's like, hey, we're just looking for a church. You're not looking for a church, you're looking for a people. And we know that and I hope we're people, <laughs> we're good people. But if we're not your people, I hope you find some people and I'll help you find your people. <laughs> right? God calls us to a people, not a place. I remember when the first Sunday that I ever spoke before I was even the pastor and it was kind of the horse and pony show where you preach and see if people like you, right? Afterwards, they did a question. One of the guys said, you've been in big cities and you've been in big churches and you've done all that kind of stuff. Why do you want to come to a little church in the middle of nowhere here? And I said, I don't know that I want to. I'm just, I'm here checking it out too, right? And they said, but do you feel called to Cleveland? And the answer is no. I remember I said it. No. But here's what I've realized. I don't think God's called anybody to a place. I think he calls them to a people. And when I've traveled around the world to different places, I find a people. And, and, and when I've gone to India, I'm like, oh, man, <laughs> this is India. This is just kind of, let's go preach and come home because this is weird. But I found my people. And I'm looking at my wife going, want to move to India? <laughs> go places in Africa. And it's like my son was there. And it's like, dude, I think I could live here. You think you live in Africa? Because I found my people, Right. I've been to certain places in the country where it's like, oh my God, my people are here, right? I've been to other places in the U.S. and I'm like, nope, we're not moving here. None of my people. <laughs> Y'all know what I'm talking about, right? God doesn't call us to a place. He always calls us to a people. Always calls us to a person, right? L listen, your most ideal place, you can say my, my ideal place, if I'm in the fight of my life, my ideal place is to get to the beach. My ideal place is to get to the mountains. I've got to get where it's a scenic view. Somebody said my, my ideal place is shopping with a limitless credit card. My ideal place is wherever it may be, okay? But here's what I'm saying. You can have an ideal place, but the ideal place can always be improved or ruined by the addition or subtraction of a person. Like, you can get to heaven. If somebody's not there, it's not going to be that awesome, is it? Here's the thing. Some of you, you can get to your ideal place, and all of a sudden they show up, and you're like, well, that ruins everything. <laughs> Isn't that true? I remember being at a theme park, having free tickets, had to go speak somewhere, had these interns with me. We hit the park. We got free tickets. All they, they go ride everything. I'm there by myself for a few moments. First thing I see is Spider-Man. At that time, Isaac was really young, loved Spider-Man. First thing I did, I walked in, it's like, oh my gosh, Spider-Man is taking pictures with everybody. Isaac, gosh, he would love that if he was here. Then I go around the corner and I'm like, oh my gosh, my, my kids, Isabel, Ireland, they would love that if they were here. And then we're going around and there was like, some, and oh man, Krista would love that if they were here. I rode nothing and within 20 minutes I'm back in my hotel room. Because the most ideal place is not ideal if you don't have your people. And some of us will move from city to city and place to place because it is so beautiful. It's ideal. And we find ourselves in a cave like Elijah. And God said, what are you doing here? What are you doing here? You see, our, sometimes our relationships are so superficial, so surface. You know, it's just a, hey, how you doing? Fine kind of thing. It's just a, that even with our family, they get superficial. That nowhere feels like home. And all we do is drift from wilderness to wilderness and cave to cave. And God's saying, what are you doing here? So how do you find your people? Because if you find your people, you find your place. How do you find your people? Well, here we go, quickly. Your people will share your purpose. You see, God's remedy for Elijah and his depression was not like some Zoloft and some Xanax and all the other stuff. God's, and I'm not, nothing wrong with that. Sometimes there's some biological and chemical and, there, and life is hard, right? Okay, listen, when you're getting beat up in the ring, don't knock the doctor on the side tending the wounds, okay? <laughs> you need that some, okay? So listen, I, no, not knocking that. Been there, done that, okay? But God's remedy ultimately for the depression that Elijah had was a person, 
and a purpose. A person and a purpose. Here's what he said. I want you to go back the way you came. You left the servant back there. He's the number one thing you need right now. I want you to go back the way you came. I want you to pick him up. Here's the other thing. When you get back to the way you came, I want you to go anoint some kings. Hey, by the way, these are going to be kings of enemy nations, and they're really ungodly kings. But I'm doing something with them, and I'm going to use them in the whole story of Israel. So I want you to go to a place where you don't think I'm working, and I want you to do something there because I'm doing something beyond you and your people. So I want you to go there. So you got a purpose. you got a person. Oh, by the way, I want to give you another person. I want you to pick up your family member. Right? I want you to go get Elisha. Elisha is going to follow you as the next big prophet. And so I want you to grab him. So here's the thing. I want you to go find this person, get this person, and you and this person have the same purpose. And that is to be the voice piece of God to reveal my activity to the people. So here's God's remedy was a person and a purpose. And they shared that. Listen, this is why, and, and this is so simple. It sounds so simple. You would just sit there and go, it doesn't work. There's no way this could work. It's just too simple. But this is why serving on a, a ministry team, volunteering somewhere, is so vital for us. It's not because we need people to do the job. We can get the job done. It's because you need a people. And sometimes when you find out your skills, abilities, talents, gifts, interests, just availability, and all, whether it's standing at the door greeting, it's not just about standing at the door greeting. It's about having a people. And, and your people might be standing at the door greeting with you. It's not just about teaching kids. I mean, yes, we need kids, but sometimes it's that shared purpose of teaching kids that you find your people in the classroom also teaching the kids. It, it's not just about you know, passing out the food. It's whenever you take your gifts and talents and abilities and experiences and resources and all of that stuff, and for no gain of your own, it's not going to build your, your fame, your reputation. You're not going to get paid for it. There is nothing that you will get out of it other than the joy of benefiting others. And when you have a person and a purpose, that's doing that together, you found your people. And you say, that's just so simple. It is. And that's why we overlook it and we lack a people. You see, not only do they share your purpose, your people, your people can share your predicament, like your situation that you're in, or their predicament is what provokes you. And here's what I mean by that, okay? Drugs and alcohol. We've got people who are in drugs and alcohol recovery, and I'm so glad that you come together. But here's the thing. It's like, yeah, I got addicted. They're addicted. We're trying to, you know, crawl out of this together. My people, right? Whenever you say, yeah, I'm, my marriage is going through the ringer. There's going through the ringer. We're in kind of this marriage group talking about how to improve our marriage. My people, when we're saying I'm trying to rebuild broken relationships with my kids or I'm trying to be a better grandparent to my kids and there's somebody else trying to be a better grandparent to their kids, my people, whenever you're sitting in the hospital, I've been with some of you, when you're sitting in the hospital and you're hooked up getting your chemo treatment, you don't want to be there, but my people, suddenly there's a bond, isn't there? Because you share the same predicament. Or maybe you say, I've not had that predicament. But when I see people in that predicament, oh my gosh, it provokes me. It makes me angry. It makes me sad. It makes me heartbroken. It moves me. It concerns me. It consumes me. I have to do something. And when you look out and you see you know, people with the homeless issue or people who are dealing you know, with financial issues or health issues or relational issues or whatever, you know, jobless issues, and it just it does something to you. It makes you so emotional. That's your people. That's your people. And see, your predicament or their predicament and what's provoking you is helping you identify them. That's why we have men's group because, you know, men have the same predicament. You know, they're men and that's enough of a challenge right there. <laughs> right? We have women's groups for the same reason because of men being their predicament and so they get together <laughs> as women. <laughs> right? That's their group. <laughs> right? However they form, they form, right? But no, seriously, but then you do have marriage groups and you have young married groups. You have young adult group because there's a predicament right there. It's like, gosh, what do I'm going to do with the rest of my life? I got a degree. I don't know if I want to use this thing, right? And, and so there's that whole challenge, right? There's the, the remarried group, like second time. There's the empty nester stuff. We have all types of various support groups and recovery groups, all that in the church, in the community, everywhere else. Some of that's your people. Do you know, spill the beans here, we've actually got a group of parents that are starting to come together and they're dealing with a unique predicament because they either have a child or a grandchild who is confused about their sexuality and their gender and all of these other things and they're just like, man, we were not prepared for this and we don't know how to deal with this. And so they come together and it's like, my people, right? These are my people. So whatever causes you that 
that anger, that emotion, that might be an indication of your people. Let me, let me ask you this. Where's the place that you run to? Not, not the place you run to when you're trying to run away from others, right? I'm going to the beach, getting away from you people, right? I know, I went on a cruise a while back. Everybody's like, where are you going on a cruise to? <laughs> I have no, I don't care where it's going. It's where I'm trying to get from. That's what's important, right? <laughs> just take me in anywhere, <laughs> right? This, it was a Jonah cruise. Just get me out of here, <laughs> right? I'm not talking about where you run from to get away from others. Where's the place you run to specifically because of others? If I can just get to them. It reminds me of Ruth and Naomi. You'll find that story in the book of Ruth, Old Testament. Ruth and Naomi. Naomi's an Israelite woman. And her sons marry Moabite women. Moabites and Israelites do not get along. But whenever you've got all these warring tribes, what do you do? To try to keep people from fighting, you just kind of have these politically arranged marriages. Keep people from fighting one another. So her Israelite sons marry Moabite women. The Moabites don't even worship God. They worship other gods and stuff too. And so it's somewhat of a mess. And Ruth is one of her daughter-in-laws, right? And so whenever all of her sons die, now she's got these daughters and daughter-in-laws, right, who don't have sons. And then Naomi's husband dies. So now you've got all of these women who are widows, can't own property, don't have really much of an economic you know, future ahead of them. And so she looks at her daughters and she said, this is a terrible plight. We're all in the same predicament. Y'all just go back to your parents. Y'all go back to your family. Go back to your people. And... Ruth says, no, 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 no. Something has happened. Something has changed. Here's what Ruth responds. But Ruth replied, don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. That's my place. Where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God, my God. See, here's the thing. I can go back to my family, I understand, but something has happened since we have been together and something has formed us and now we're in the same predicament and not only that, I now have the same faith, and they don't have the same faith. And so here's the thing. They're not my people. You're my people. And your people are my people. And your God is my God. And, and we're in the same predicament. And so whatever's before us, we'll go through it together. Because here's the thing. When I'm in the middle of the fight, you're the one in my corner. Don't send me back somewhere else I, just because I've got some blood relationship. And some of you know this. Some of you know that you have a spiritual family that's greater than your biological family. She goes on and she says, where you die, I will die. There I'll be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if anything but death separates us. Now, some of you had that read at your wedding or you think that's romantic, husband and wife. No, 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 no. This is a daughter-in-law to her mother-in-law, right? And she's saying, you've become my people. But I'm Moabite and you're Israelite and I'm Israelite, and you're Moabite, and I'm this, and I'm that. Listen, here's what, here's what I take away from this. Your people may be nothing like you, but they bring out the best in you. And I think of my own daughter, Isabel, my oldest one, lives in Atlanta. You know, when Isabel was growing up, um, when we were living in Gwinnett, it's like our backyard, when the kids would all come and play, was like the UN, and she was the one lone white representative, because there was every other nationality in the backyard. And when she started preschool and, and pre-K, I mean, if, if she was, and again, if she was in a room that had like, you know, I don't know, 20 kids and there was two minorities, the minorities were her best friends. In fact, I remember when she was in kindergarten, she, was, she kept talking about this one friend. And I'm like, oh, Isabel, so that's a little black girl in your class. And she goes, no, we don't have any black kids in my class. And I'm like, well, I know you do because I saw three of them, right? And, she's like, well, and we kept trying to figure it out. So finally, open house, we go, and it's like, Isabel, show us your friend. She goes, it's that girl over there. And it's like, Isabel, that's a black girl in your class. She goes, Dad, her skin's brown. Why do you call her black? <laughs> hmm. That's a good answer. You know, okay, I'm just looking for my kid's eyes, right? When she was in third grade, she wants to spend the night at somebody's house. Well, we don't let you spend the night with somebody we don't know, and they need, you know, we don't know their values and all that kind of stuff. And it's like, oh, they're great. You'd love them. They're Christians, all that kind of stuff. It's like, well, we need to talk to the parents. You can't. Why? Because they don't speak English. Interesting, okay? So we're having to translate through a third grade child to the parents so that she can go to, I think they were from Vietnam or Thailand or something, and she goes and spends the night at their house. Here's the thing. My daughter right now, where she lives, all of her friends, for most of us, we would look at it and say, they are nothing like her, but man, they bring out the best in her. And I've been challenged, and I've learned, and I've grown, and my perspective has been opened because my daughter has found her people, and her people were nothing like her, but man, they bring out the best in her. And as a result, she brings out the best of, or the better in me. <laughs> Listen, all of that's not enough. 
They can bring out the best in you. They can be your purpose. They can have all that kind of stuff. But listen, your people keep their relationship with God and doing his will the top priority. Your people keep their relationship, not yours. They don't, it's not just I respect your religion. No, 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 no. They keep their relationship with God and the, the, following the will of God in their life, the top priority of their life. That's your people. Because these shared priorities, shared predicament, all that stuff, shared passions, thing that provoked you, all of that, even bringing out the best in you, all that, let's just be honest, that's a really good TED talk that works for anybody, anywhere. And they will still mislead you. Because listen, if somebody will sideline Jesus to follow their own desires or their own passion, if they're going to sideline Jesus to follow their own politics or the politics of somebody else, if they're going to put Jesus and God and his word in the rearview mirror so that they can go chase something else because they think it'll make them happy or successful or whatever, they advise you to do the same. They're not your people. They're not your people. And that's the thing. That's where you all of a sudden found yourself in the wrong corner. And they're giving me all kind of advice that sounds good, but you're in the wrong corner. That's not your people. Listen, they may be far from God and you love them dearly. They may be your spiritual project. They're not your people. Right? God may send you to, and I know that's harsh to hear. It's like, man, God wants a project. God may send you to them, have them in your life, and you need to love them deeply, care for them, spend time and all that kind of stuff. But you also need to realize I'm not taking advice from them because their priority is not keeping God first in their life. So when it comes to my marriage and all of a sudden they say, I just leave. I tell you what, I wouldn't put up with that. Not your people. When they say, I tell you what I'd do with that kid. And, I'm not kind of, and, and God's not in the middle of that. Not your people. If what they are telling you is not God honoring first and foremost and completely, they're not your people. You will get beat up and lose that fight following those people. They're not your people. Right? So if you make those who are far from God, who are unconcerned about God and His will. If you make them your people, your people will become your problem. They will become your problem. I love what Jesus says here, okay? Jesus is teaching one day, and, and his mom and his brothers come to the door, and they're like, hey, your mom and brother's out there. They want to come talk to you. And he replies to them, who is my mother? Who are my brothers? Wait, you said my people are at the door. Who's, who's my people? Who do you think my people are? Let me tell you who my people are. He goes on, pointing to his disciples. He said, here's my mother and my brother. This is my people. For whoever does the will of my father in heaven, that's my brother, my sister, and my mother. Listen, this is not to slight my mom. My mom's in touch with God. But my biological brothers, Jesus would have said at that time, my biological brothers, they are completely missing God right now. They think I am full of the devil. They have no idea who I am. So let me just tell you, if you think that's my people, no, 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 no. This right here is my people. And even Jesus said that. And Jesus is sitting around a group of sinners and broken, messed up people and says, these are my people because they are searching for God above everything else and they want to be in alignment with him. Listen, let me just tell you this. God's place and God's purpose is with his people. It's not some distant thing out there and, you know, in heaven or somewhere off and we're not just some kind of play thing and all that. God's place where he abides, where he resides, his purpose, his, his whole existence and being is with his people. It's for his people. And listen, our predicament, the problem we're in, that's what provokes him. It angers him. It breaks his heart. It moves him. He cannot just sit back and stay kind of out of the picture. It's why he steps into the whole thing. Even in the Garden of Eden, the very beginning of the story, whenever he creates this you know, ideal place, the ideal place can be awful if you remove God from the equation. The ideal place can be so improved, right? Perfect man, God. Man, what do we do to improve this? Add a woman. Yeah, there you go. You see, the most ideal place when you have this relationship with God, relationship with others. There's, there's two times in Scripture where Jesus is, is seen weeping. or I'm sure he cried more than that. But two times specifically, they highlighted that he wept. One of them was over the death of Lazarus, his friend. And when he saw what death did to people, I mean, he knew this. He understood this. He, he had probably seen death a million times. I mean, he had already raised people from the dead and all that. But here you've got Lazarus. And when he sees the heartbreak, when he sees the grief, when this is his friend, and when he sees the separation, somebody being removed from their people, somebody losing one of their people, it grieves him because death. 
death seems to be winning. And so it says he wept. But then he restores Lazarus and brings him back to life to let us know that death is not the end. And then when he's going into Jerusalem and they're having a parade for him and hailing him as king, and he just realizes, y'all are cheering like crazy, but you just don't realize how far from God you are. And your predicament of being so far from God and so deceived and so self-interested, in fact, you want me as a king for t- totally selfish reasons. And it just breaks his heart. You see, his place, God's place was with us. And this is what's interesting. It's why God comes to us. It's why he came to us in the form of Jesus, his son, in the first place. It's why he still comes to us through his Holy Spirit. Because his place is with us. His purpose is wrapped up in us. And our predicament provokes him to kind of, you know, squeeze his way. And it's not until we get into the cave of our own depression and misery sometimes that we are really willing to say, okay, God, I'll give you a shot. And at that point, you would think, like us, God's going to say, no, 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 you've run long enough. You did this on your own, right? This is whatever mess you're in is your own fault, right? Elijah, I, I don't know why you were running here. You were afraid. You could have come to me. You could to turn to me, but you, you ditched everybody, went out here to have your pity party, so just sulk in it, son. No, no, no. He says, listen, a bruised reed, like, you know, this, just a reed. You know what a reed is, right? If it's just bent over already, he's not going to break it. He's going to lift it. And it's why when we're at the bottom and we feel like we have no right to call on him, if we will just say, God, I can't ask for much. Would you just kill me? He rushes in and says, why are you here? Because I got more for you. And it involves you getting back with your people. Elijah says, I'm the only one, God. And God says, nope, I've got a bunch that you don't even know about that you're not taking into consideration. I need to get you back with them. It's not just you. There's a whole lot of yous. I need to get you back to your people. You see, Jesus came, the Holy Spirit still comes. And this is what's so beautiful. We're nothing like him. Yes, we're made in his image, but come on. We are sinners. We are broken. We are selfish. We are self-interested, self-motivated, right? We don't have patience. We don't have enough kindness. We don't have all the long suffering we need. We definitely don't love everybody, right? We we are just as quick to pick up, like, you know, go to blows with our friends, not to mention our enemies. We are nothing like him. And yet, we bring out the best in him. What I mean by that is, He is so loving and so kind and so patient and so forgiving and so gracious. And when we just see how bad we can be as humanity, as individuals, when we just look how bad we are, it just reveals how awesome he is. Nothing like him. But man, doesn't it reveal the best in him? Here's the thing. He's nothing like us. But man, he brings out the best in us. When we get with him, Listen, the reason this is so important, and you've got to know where your corner is, and you say, well, where do I go? Where do I go? It's not where do I go. It's who do I go to? And yes, I can go to God. And you absolutely need to go to God, but you also need a people. The reason it's so important is because your relationships determine the direction and the quality of your life, and you know that. Your relationships influence decisions you make. But they also determine how great your life is. Listen, you may have retired in the most perfect place with the greatest house. But when your children are away from you, the quality of your life is diminished. When you don't have a people, the quality of your life is diminished. And you know that. And so the relationships in your life that determine the direction of the quality of your life, none more important than the relationship you have with Jesus. None more important than that. But Jesus often works through people to make himself known, to make his presence known, to make his will known. And all. Yes, we can hear his voice, and I think it is interesting that it was a small voice, a voice that drew Elijah out of the cave. Not all of the fanfare of natural disasters, displays of power, it's a voice. And sometimes what we need is to hear the voice of God. And I want to tell you, there's been many times in my life where the voice of God in my head was made very loud and clear coming out of the mouth of someone else. Because they were telling me things that I wasn't sure was God, but they confirmed it and affirmed it. 
So that's why I want to help you find your place, first of all, with Jesus. But I also want you to help you find your people. And so when we talk about growth groups, you know, you can sign up for growth group now. You go, I don't want to do a growth group. It's not just a program. It's a place to find your people. And so I want you to keep at it, keep trying, and, and form your own if you need to. We'll help you do that. But, but I just want you together with your people. I want you on a ministry team. If you say, well, how do I find out about that? Listen, we have this thing called Next Steps. It happens on three Sundays. Normally it would start this morning, but I think that, you know, Jeff talked about just postponing the launch of that till next week. So some of you can get, you may have been coming to this church for your entire life, as long as I've been here, whatever. Get in the next step because it will help you to be able to kind of, you know, take a fast track to finding your people. And even if it's not here at the bridge, I understand people visit all the time. If you say, I don't know, it just didn't click with anybody, let us know. We'll help you find the church. We just want you with your people. As we close today with communion, haven't done this in a while, right there in the seats in front of you, you'll see the little communion cups. You pull the little plastic part back if you can, <laughs> and there's bread, and then you can pull the aluminum foil part back and you'll get to the the juice. If you're sitting on those front rows, front row right here, uh, somebody's coming right now and they're going to bring it to you on the front row here and in that front section uh, or the second section back there, front row. You know, it's interesting. Whenever you read the story of Jesus in this Last Supper when he took the bread and he took the wine and he gave it a whole new meaning and, and kind of instituted this as a, as a spiritual moment, um, it's interesting. Here's what he, here's what he said. He was, he was preparing them. He said, hey guys, I'm going to prepare a place for you. I'm going to prepare a corner for you, right? I'm going to prepare a place for you. And he said this, he goes, in my father's house are many rooms. And some of you, you, know, you say the translation says mansions. The, the literal word there is rooms. In my father's house are many rooms. We think of heaven when he's talking about that. They would have thought the temple, you know, the house of God. In my father's house at the temple are many rooms, and there were, and it's for the priests and the Levites and those who were special to God, right? And they get to be close to God. Here's what he said. In my father's house, in this temple, you know, this place that has become like Mount Sinai, like Mount Horeb, the place that Moses heard from God, God's presence showed up and spoke. They felt him. They sensed him. They saw him. The place where Elijah ran to in his desperate moment looking for that experience. The place you go to to make your sacrifices, where you burn your incense, where the ark of the covenant of God's presence, all of that, all of, he said, listen, in, in my father's house, in the place where you think he abides, there's plenty of room. And I'm going there to prepare a place for you to make room for you. Right? I'm going to go make room for you. And then he says this, and if I go, I'm going to come back so that where I am, you will be also. And that phrase, where I am, is not meaning where I am going to be in the future. He says, where I am right now, you will be. What does that mean? Jesus is saying, I'm one with the Father. He says that. If you've seen the Father, you've seen me. I am constantly, I don't care what life looks like on the outside, I am in constant communion and awareness of God's presence, awareness of God's voice, awareness of God's will. And I'm getting ready to step into the ring and it's going to be ugly. And here's the thing, I'm going to hit the mat and it's going to look like game over. But let me tell you what I'm really doing. I'm going to prepare a place for you through my blood and my sacrifice so that where I am right now, experiencing the presence of God, experiencing the reality of God, hearing God's voice and knowing his will, so that you can experience that too. And if I go down to the mat, I want you to know I'm gonna get back up and come so that this experience I have with God every day, you can have too. That's what he was saying. He was saying, there's a place that I'm preparing for you and that you there is you all. It's not just for you. It's for you and your people. So he did this by offering his body in that ring and spilling his blood on the ground. Let's remember his body broken for us. His blood spilled for us so that we could have a place. And as he looked around that room and said, these are my people, so that we could be his people. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, I pray that today anybody who came into this room distant from you, Lord, that they feel drawn to you and that they hear the whisper of your voice right now. And Lord God, that they would cry out to you and, and it wouldn't be just for death. 
for a quick end for, for you to come. But Lord God, it would be for your direction and your guidance and for you to lead them to a people. If anyone's coming in this place or watching online or listening to this later and they are in the most beautiful place they could ever be, but they are alone, God, I pray that you would guide them to their people. Someone who puts you first in their own life, who has you as a priority. And Lord, maybe they didn't share the purpose. Maybe they share the same predicament. Maybe there's all these other things that they could have in common. But Lord God, it would start with a people that puts you first. And Lord God, would you direct them to that? Lord, if there's anybody in this congregation, in this group of gathering, who's living life alone, Lord, I know some have a bandwidth for a lot more relationships than others, but I pray that everyone can have at least one or two or three. So would you give them the courage, Heavenly Father? First of all, give them the sensitivity to hear your voice when, when you're asking them why they're sitting in isolation. Give them the sensitivity to hear your voice when you're directing them to go connect with someone or to go to a place where they might can find connection and then give them the courage to get out of their cave and go find their people. Lord God, do great things through us. But do it through us not just me or some individual. It's in the name of your son Jesus we pray.